Okay. Welcome, everyone. Um, we are here today to demystify and understand contracts around relationship and marriage. Um, welcome to another episode of Splitting Smart, where Heather and I have candid and informative discussions with divorce and well being professionals. I'm Lila Aiken Ali, a divorcee, a divorce coach, and the founder of Split FYI. And I'm Heather Steer, a divorcee, a CDFA, divorce coach, and the co-founder of Split FYI. Uh, before we get too far into this and introduce our next guest, I want to highlight some of our webinar protocols. So if you have any questions for Julie, you can put them in either the chat box or the q and I'll try to monitor both. Um, and if there's a good segue, I'll uh, introduce them along the way. Otherwise, we do leave time at the end. Uh, for any questions that we have. So today we are honored to have Julie Mack return as our guest on Splitting Smart. Thank you, Julie. Uh, Julie is uh, an attorney with over 23 years of experience uh, here in California. She uniquely approaches every case by, cra by crafting uh, unique plans that are tailored to the individual needs um, of the couple instead of just following how things are traditionally done. And as a former social service worker, Julie appreciates clients' need for solid communication, which we will be diving into, um, and ways of communication, a strong advocacy, emotional support, and efficient case management, all driving principles of her approach and teamwork ethics. So typically, we are talking about transitioning out of relationships, i.e. divorce. <laughs> At the time that people are going through divorce, they can't fathom getting involved with someone again in a way that would financially tie them down or be with someone because the whole detangling process is painful um, and very difficult. So, but those memories fade as new love is found and it is usually found. So in today's chat, we will be discussing transitioning into new relationships and the types of agreements that you could put in place to protect yourself, your assets and your legacy. Also, we have some guidance on how to have conversations and how a professional can support you and your partner. Welcome, Julie. It's so good to have you again. Thank you for having me. I'm really looking forward to this topic. It is one of my, my passions to talk to people about transitioning in and out of relationships. Oh, I think this is such a great one. Um, I think early on when we first uh, were getting to know each other, this was uh, one of the conversations that we we talked about, like it's, you know, you're not expected to stay with someone at 16 until you're 95 anymore. Like the, with, you know, lives lasting longer, us living longer, excuse me. Um, you know, it's, it's very common that you're going to have more than one partner in life and one or more partner that you're going to be tied to, whether, you know, officially or not. So um, I want to spend a couple minutes, if we could talk about, you um, some of the buzzwords in this area, cohabitation <laughs> agreements, post-nups, prenups, um, any sort of, you know, the, the contractual side of things uh, in, in the um, transitions, that would be great. Sure, I'll kind of give an overview. You know, you have people who just wanna move in together. Maybe they wanna buy a home together and they need to have some sort of a financial understanding of how they're going to hold property and how they're gonna handle their financial affairs. So you can do that through a contract. You can have a cohabitation agreement. I hate that word because it sounds so formal, but it's just something to sit down with the person you're gonna be moving in with and say, how are we gonna pay our bills? How are we gonna share finances? Do we set up a joint account? And then you write out a two page contract of what that looks like. It doesn't have to be anything complex. When you're buying real estate, you would have a real estate contract. So that's kind of your cohabitation agreement. Then you have a prenup, which, Everybody hates the idea of the word prenup. It sends them into terror and they don't want to talk about it at all. And we'll get more into some details about how I think people should be approaching that conversation. But premarital agreements are just, they're saying we don't want the family law code to apply to our marriage, or at least not all of it. So we're going to come up with our own contract for how we handle money. And it can be a great way for you to have good financial discussions before you marry somebody anyway. So that's a premarital agreement. It's supposed to govern what happens to your assets during a marriage and if you get divorced. And then we also have something called postmarital agreements that a lot of people don't talk about. 
sometimes people don't want to get divorced. They just they want to control their assets differently or hold property differently. And you can do that in a marriage and not get divorced. Like these are things that you can do. And then of course you have your marital settlement agreements and your divorce work, which we've talked about. And I'm sure you guys have spent many hours talking about. So I'd really like to focus today on moving into new relationships. How do you talk about money with your partner, your new partner, and what kind of contracts are people entering into and why? I think uh, one of the important things that you point out, because it's, you know, when I heard the, the prenup part, it's that you want to manage your assets through the life of your marriage differently than what the family code of uh, maybe in our state, California dictates, right? And it's fascinating because when you do get married in, in any state, you are signing a contract. We just yeah. don't, we aren't aware of it, right? Like, I laugh all the time because people say, I don't want a prenup. It's just so complicated. I said, well, you have one. <laughs> My former business partner, Sean Weber, used to say all the time, you have a prenup. And he would get out the California family code, drop it on the table and said, that's what you all signed up for. But nobody knows. And until the until our county or our state gets around to doing classes to educate people about what they're actually doing when they get married and forming a partnership, then we need to talk about it in that way. We need to talk about it differently. We need to talk about contracts and prenups and what you're entering into when you decide to get married to a person. It's a partnership. Nobody goes in, well, very few people go into business relationships without a partnership agreement or bylaws or forming a business entity to deal with it. I mean, they're just natural things for a partnership. Well, you're forming a partnership in California. It's just that you get to be a partner and somebody else makes all the rules. I, I had a business partner that we jokingly said, if we ever had to go through the amount of work we went through getting educated with our attorneys, when we were partnering up, we would have like, if we would have had to do that with our wife and husbands, we wouldn't have gotten married. <laughs> I mean, you just when if we would have really gotten educated about all that, I, or we would have done it differently, like we would have maybe done the prenup idea and planned everything out that we were planning for in our business partnership. So uh, why do you think though, why do you think it is that, and this is the thing, this is happens a lot. First of all, we, I, I know we talked about this earlier. Um, a lot of people, unless you're really savvy with contracts or you've been exposed to contracts, they have that fear of that contractual binding thing, even though they did get married and they did sign a contract, they don't view it as that because a lot of people have this view of, you know, marriages, the, the white dress down the aisle or whatever it is, or it's like, you know, 200 people at their wedding and people are more concentrating, you know, they're concentrating on that part and that aspect of it rather than the romantic part of it, so to speak. I know. And, and I, I laugh at the idea that somebody is going to go to wedding planner shows. They're going to interview all these people to do the flowers and test 18 different types of cake for their wedding celebration but they haven't once sat down and said, what assets do you have? How do you want to share our money? I make this, you make that. How are we going to do this? What happens if one of us stays home with children? How are we going to compensate that person in the future? Right. I mean, I'm sorry, but those are a lot longer lasting concerns than are we going to get tulips or, or roses for the table? And I love weddings. I, I love going to them. They, they're they wonderful. And I love new relationships and I love all that hope. But take that and talk. Our society stigmatizes premarital agreements. Yes. They've traditionally been viewed as something that rich people do to keep their money from the poor people that they're bringing into the family. Mm -hmm. yes. And I still have a number of clients who are only getting prenups because their parents said, you're not going to get part of the family business unless you do a prenup. Right. I'll just tell them that. And so then you have a person who comes in and they're terrified. They don't know why their new spouse isn't trusting them. They don't trust me. Or that's the way it feels. It feels about trust. This is not about trust. This is not about somebody coming to take your money or not take your money. This is about two people who are entering into the partnership of marriage, who I hope love each other, trust each other, and want the best future for each other. And so mm -hmm. it's, it's really no different than two people who have children and talk about, should we get life insurance? Mm -hmm. That's an easy conversation. I'm sure both of you in your lives have had a conversation with a former spouse or a sister or somebody, maybe you should get life insurance. 
why not have that same freedom to discuss how you're going to handle money and protect your, your new family and the family that you have before in a document? And it goes beyond that because, I mean, there's a lot of nuances into that. Like there's the money aspect of it, but it's also how you want to spend it. Yes. So can we circle into that? Because that's an interesting, and I think that's also a big fear. And when people do, you know, again, it's a romantic side. You, you, you're dating someone, you really like them. You start mm -hmm. bonding, you're doing this and it's the dating, it's the this. You might see there's aspects that you guys spend differently. You know, one person likes to spend here and another person likes to spend there, but you don't really think and consider it as an issue until that contract, they're married, and you have completely different views of where to either save money or invest in money or spend money. So tell us a little bit about how that can really help because it's not about just you know protecting somebody's family assets. No, it's really not. One of the, the best experiences I had doing a, a premarital agreement for a couple was a young couple. They're in their, I don't know, 31, 32 years old. And they didn't have a ton of assets, but they had jobs and they knew that they were going to be spending differently because the couple of years that they had been dating, she knew she liked to save money. And her family background was, you have to stay for a rainy day. I don't feel comfortable unless I'm putting some money away from each of my paychecks. And he mm -hmm. was like, I really like to travel and I like to buy toys, motorcycles, whatever. And that can create a lot of stress for people in their marriage when they have different values about money. It's not just about, is there $20 left at the end of the month or 200? It's about, am I being respected for my views on money and how we're sharing things? And so that it, it's a lot deeper. And so they knew that it would cause problems or she knew it would cause problems. If she saved all her money, he spent a lot of his money, they got divorced and she had to split what she saved. I mean, she knew that that would not be okay. So they created a small prenup. They decided that each of them would be able to segregate out 10% of their gross income. Very smart. And they put 10% of their gross income into a separate accounts. So one was funded in IRA and one funded in an account. And they wanted a new motorcycle or new toys or new whatever those video games are. You go buy them out of that account. And she put her money away. Everything else was community property. They didn't That's opt out of spousal support. They didn't opt out of how they were going to hold title or change anything. They just wanted to secure a certain parts of their income. And you know why? To not fight about it. I love it. Oh, that is brilliant. brilliant thing. I love that. And it's yeah. brilliant. And it really, it sets the stage. It really sets the stage because how many times, I mean, you know, and then you get into this, um, if you don't have these kind of conversations, then you get into people hiding what they're doing with their money. Yes. And they that, hide or they fight. <laughs> they fight. Every time he buys another toy, she's going to be pissed and tell him how stupid he is, right? Like, <laughs> that's not good. Instead, she's like, whew, my money's safe. He could buy as many stupid toys as he wants. Right. I mean, it just, it really, it, it can be that simple. <laughs> Nobody, when they're, unless they're an attorney doing this work, thinks about something that small or minute as being something that you can contract into to protect what is important to you. And the other thing is, is it allows people a forum if you're going to be in the right setting. I, I don't, we could talk about how to do a prenup and how to get there, but my mm -hmm. favorite way is to sit down with a couple as a mediator, mm -hmm. I'm not representing either one. And I'm saying, let's talk about money. That's brilliant. Okay. I really, that, and I didn't even realize that actually that can be done. Because, um, and I know many stories of there's always usually the underdog of somebody who goes, what is this? I have never even sat with a lawyer before. Here I am sitting with a lawyer, another lawyer who's telling me, oh, wait a minute, this is not a good deal for you. This is not this. No, you, know, you shouldn't be signing that. And all of a sudden, that's where the fight starts coming in because one person is protecting whatever and because they have more to protect maybe, or they are saying this is like you said, the family assets or whatever it is. And the other one is feeling like, oh my goodness, should I be fighting for, and it becomes, then all of a sudden that's where the fight starts happening and people want to yeah. avoid that. So what you just said is brilliant. I love this idea of a mediated prenup. <laughs> yes, and especially with the mediator who understands money, understands a little bit about behavioral finance so that you can 
you can hear certain words that people use and it kind of triggers, oh, I, that person might have a childhood memory of this, but I'm just guiding discussions about money and how you want to handle your own money in a, in a marriage. And I've done this in a free setting with two and two parties or just me and two people who I'm not representing either one, but those are so much safer, like safer venues than the worst thing is that you say you're going to get a prenup you have somebody have their attorney write it up. It gets delivered to the other person's attorney. They read it and go, oh my God, what the hell is this? It, it really, that experience, which happens with half the people who are doing this right now, that experience, is one of the reasons why people don't want to get these. It's a misperience when you have two attorneys kind of fighting for what your rights are on the road. That doesn't feel right when you're entering into a marriage, but talking about contracts should feel right. Talk about your dreams and your hopes and your expectations. That should feel right. A hundred percent. I mean, and in fact, we shouldn't feel scared to do so. And I always think about that. I mean, we really do have a lot of fear around the conversation around money and that trickles down to so many different things, i.e. when you have children. Okay. How do you want to spend on your children? You know, that's a huge aspect of it too. Do you want them to send them to private school? Do you want to send them to public school? Do you want to send them, you know, do they go to boarding school? Do they, you know, there's a three already one fact or, you know, do we get help? And even if you're a stay at home mother or stay at home father, I mean, you can't do it all. You're not superhuman. Oh. You're going to need a little bit of help. And is that feasible? And can we put some money aside? Or, I mean, I have some friends who are like, well, we should have put um, a housekeeper in the prenup because I am not giving that up. You know, I, you know, it's, it's an interesting, cause you don't think about it, especially when you're young or you're getting married, maybe on your second marriage, a little more savvy, but you know, in the first, especially it is a bit, one of those, I don't know what to think about. What am I supposed to think about? You can't conceptualize it. So do, do you as a mediator, as a lawyer, do you help guide them to understanding and questioning some of those things and not in a bad way. I don't mean questioning the money aspect, but have they thought about certain things? Is there like a tool to, is there? Yeah. I mean, one of the things I'm developing is kind of an online questionnaire that people can work towards. And that's just in the future as I'm trying to make this more normal for couples. But a lot of these conversations, it's, it's easy when you've already been divorced. So like the typical situation, you know, I'm divorced, I'm 49 years old. I live with my boyfriend. We own a home together. He's 51. We can talk about our finances. I know that I want my paycheck and my business income to go to my account. And I don't want anybody telling me that I spent too much or too little on my kids. They're adults that, you know, right? I want to pay for college or help him with the, something for his house. I don't want to ask anybody if I can do that. So I would never want to get married and have money that wasn't my own. So in the second marriage, it's a little easier. First marriages though, what I would love to see people who are getting married for the first time be educated about what happens to, especially to women when they decide to give up their careers to stay home. What are the long-term repercussions of that? Mm -hmm. there, there are people now who are actually mediating and deciding in a prenup, if one of us stays home, we're going to set aside like a retirement account and a savings account that puts money in to compensate that person for their services if there's enough money i mean there's just there's things that you can do and you can be creative as to what your needs are and the beauty about this is our needs change over time and we can create contracts during our marriage that change the prenup mm -hmm. that change something else i mean we can do all of that but nobody tells us that we can well, that was one of the questions actually that we wanted to understand is like do you tell people like, is it good for them to check in every what year or two years? Or is there a time where they should say, hey, why don't we revisit this contract? Almost like a living contract, you know, like rather than a one set in stone, one off. Sure. And, and people can, just like you review your estate planning documents, you review how much money you're putting away for your kids if you're lucky enough to be able to do that. You review your life insurance, you review your retirement accounts, you just review your paperwork and say, hey, I wanna change this. I drafted several prenups that have an expiration. They're really, if something happens in the first five years, there's no spousal support, we keep our assets separate, everything's done. If we stay married longer than that, then this is what happens. Or sometimes you can negotiate for spousal support and say, we're gonna, set a certain amount or there's a waiver of spousal support, but if we're married for more than 10 years, all that goes away. 
And so it, there, you know, you can do this. You can contract based on what your current needs are. You can change it in the future, or you can plan for something in the future. And all of those depend on where you are in life, what stage you're in. You know, are you 28 years old with no money and maybe going to have kids real quick? Or are you established with some family money that you'd like to keep separate? Do you want to gift money to um, your spouse? You know, people who pay off credit cards for their spouse when they get married, all sorts of things that, that people can talk about. And, and just, I just, again, I want to normalize this for, for the people in the world to make it normal, make them comfortable and give them an easy way that doesn't ruin their wedding to talk about money. Well, it's, I think it's great, the idea of sitting down with a mediator far enough in advance, because you hear those terrible stories of, you know, it's the night before the wedding and ching, here's your prenup. And if you don't sign it, I'm not marrying you tomorrow. Oh, I've heard many of those stories. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or it's a week before your wedding and you're like, you're up on this high and then suddenly, you know, you're taken out, which is, I mean, that, it's not a great approach. And I think that's where a lot of the stigma comes from or stories like that in our society. They are because one person's going to feel like they're being taken advantage of or that they're being pressured because who wants to back out of a wedding when the invitations have been sent and the caterers lined up to be there? I mean, what are you going to do? You're going to cancel at that time? You're, you're usually not. But, you know, there are a lot of situations where people actually would not get married without a prenup. Mm -hmm. they, yeah. they just they wouldn't because the risks are high and they know that, or the, the asset imbalance is so great that there needs to be some kind of a protection. And, yeah. and there shouldn't be a stigma with that either. People should be able to do what they want with their, their money and talk about it with the person that they're supposed to love the most and be the most comfortable with and the most trusting of. If you can't feel those things and talk about how to pay dental bills and how to, how to manage credit card debt, then why are you talking about getting married to this person and sharing everything? Yes, it's, it is the, I, you know, I see it a lot with the financial inequity of, or just the education, you know, with people going through a divorce where suddenly they're like, I'm so embarrassed. I have no idea what's going on in the finances. I have no idea what's happening. You know, I've just never been that person. And, and I think it's great if you can figure out how to baseline things today you know, being the day before you're getting married or the period before you're getting married so that you do have an understanding and you can evolve as the marriage evolves with, with knowing what your world is. Because a lot of people don't. I agree. And it doesn't mean that you have to equally be involved during the, the marriage with your no. finances. I mean, there's a division of labor in most relationships, right? Like yep. some person, some people handle more of the money. Some people handle more of the grocery shopping or getting the kids to school. There's natural divisions of labor, but they still talk about it. And you can talk about things as they change and plan for th different things that are going to come up in your life. So I love the idea. I mean, I love the idea of marriage. I just love the idea that two people are, especially after they've been divorced, what is, what is more hopeful than that, right? Like if you've been through a, a terrible divorce or whatever, it's heartbreaking and you're going to do it again. Like that's wonderful. That says so much about the resilience of the human spirit and what our hearts can handle. So then knowing that, let's add in, yes, it's normal to get married again. It's normal to be happy and want your family to keep on and, and have all this wonderful future. Let's talk about money too. Yeah. And it's, and it does get more complicated as you know, you iterate and you're, you get older, like you come to relationships with a different portfolio than you did in your twenties, hopefully. Right. If your <laughs> career path has gone, it's gone. Okay. But, and yeah. you also potentially have children, like for example, I have two children, my significant other has two children, and we have our own portfolio of things and, you know, and they might be different on in some aspects. And so, um, I, you know, I think as you get older, it, it almost is more important to go in with eyes wide open on that front and talking about the money and talking about what is, you know, how do you protect your legacy for your own children? Mm -hmm. um, what are your plans? And, you know, some people may just be like, no, it doesn't matter. Your kids are my kids and your vice versa, whatever. It's all even Steven. But I feel like more often than not, when there is a disparity, that isn't the case. 
Well, it also, you have to take in factor, and this is interesting that you're saying that because you're right, a lot of people do want also their children and their family to blend really well and not have that disparity. But the reality of the situation is there's step parents involved. There's, you know, different assets, different maybe wills, different, you know, prenups, all those things. So, I mean, would you advise, honestly, a, a, a blended family to really consider having some sort of other stipulation in a prenup or a will that goes along with the prenup? I mean, what is that? How would you approach a blended family situation? Well, I think the blended families are even more important to have this discussion. And mm -hmm. what a lot of us want to do is we just assume we're going to go into a relationship and we hope all the kids are treated equally. Well, what if I am divorced from somebody whose family has a lot of money and I know that they've set up trust funds for my children with their son, right? And that's going to pay all of my kids college with them. But now I have another child with my new spouse and there's no grandma or grandpa on that side that's going to pay for that child's college. And that's, you know, we should talk about then how do we make sure that all of our children can experience the same thing? We need to set up more for this child because we don't have grandma and grandpa. Those are, if you don't talk about it, what happens is then later down the road, you want to pay for things and there's not money or there's a disagreement. And then now there's a fight. But if you talk about it early on and just make it a normal part of your conversation as, as your family grows, it's, it's a lot easier. What I notice though, is a lot of blended families have no problem sitting down and talking to an estate planning attorney about what's going to happen if one of them dies. Mm -hmm. that's, that's not as scary to people. That just sounds like responsible planning right. for families. Nobody says, oh, Find a will and a trust. What a horrible person you must be. Don't you trust your spouse? Well, it's how to do with your spouse, right? So you get that kind of pushback. Responsible to have a plan in place for your family. It's responsible to have a plan in place for a family you're married. I think I was telling you this when we were before the show. Every marriage is going to end. Every single end. Death or divorce. You got to end for both D's. Mm -hmm. So... I estate love planning, that. The, the world need estate planning normal. It is so normal to talk about trust and wills and all that stuff. Like nobody bats an eye, right? Agreements and public agreements should be the same thing. Absolutely. I, I love that. And it really does start to normalize it in my mind. When you said that, I was like, yeah, that's totally true. Like I would look at my, my trust situation and have a total plan for um, my significant other, if we were living together, like my parents, actually, my parents have this in their setup. If one of them passes away, my stepmom or stepdad would stay in the house. And, you know, then after that, then things get divided. fine. But I, I totally agree. I think with, you need to plan for the divorce part. Like, and it's not that you're hoping, I mean, you would never go into getting married thinking you're getting divorced, particularly if you've already done it once. <laughs> yeah. You're thinking about it a lot harder. Um, but yeah. it, uh, you know, it's really, it's, it's very interesting. And I think that that's a great way to have that conversation with someone. If you, you know, if you're faced with needing to have this conversation with your significant other, that's a, a awesome way of doing it. And How sometimes, can argue? sometimes we're entering into contracts that we don't even know that we're doing. Like I, I, I go back to couples who are living together, you know, my boyfriend and I own a home together. Well, guess what? When we signed a deed, we signed a contract as to how we hold title and you can choose how to hold title. And there's a big difference between a joint tenancy with a right of survivorship, which means if somebody dies, that house goes to the other person without that, your joint tenants. And could you imagine unknowingly if we, somebody, one of us died, right? And we are, we have this right of survivorship without that. I could like, my kids could have to buy his kids out of the house or something. It would just, or I'd have to buy his kids out of the house. And then you don't think about that. Mm. And that's just, I just signed a deed. How many people are lucky enough to be attorneys and understand what they're signing when they're buying something? They don't know. And the notary who shows you the deed for the first time, isn't really the one to explain it when they've got to get you out of there in a half hour. And yeah, then you're, like, you just find the contract. <laughs> I know that's you just why find I think, That's why I think what 
I'm, and I'm going back to what I was saying always is like people really are afraid of contracts because it's usually not in layman's terms. They usually don't even understand what they're doing or they don't read through the finer lines because they're not used to it. I mean, you know, this is, this is your vertical and you're used to it. So you're not going to miss a beat, but most people do. And I think what I liked about what you were saying and that questioneering, I think that's where it comes in. It's educating them by asking the right questions. So when you're questioning, you know, the intake of, okay, have you thought of this? Or you thought of that? Have you asked these questions? Because that's one of them, right? So when you're looking at something, it's then you're normalizing, this is the conversation that we're supposed to be having about the house, about this, about the, the kids, about the money. That's what I like that what you're saying, because it's, it's a movement. It's a new movement. And this is so essential. I mean, I look at, you look at your kids. I look at mine, you know, I want her to be aware and I want her to have these conversations without feeling bad. I want her to be able to, you know, that's all you want, but if it continues down this path that everyone has this misconception or a fear or, or, you know, scared to have these, I mean, everybody's scared to talk about finances when they date, really they are, or it's a taboo, you know, um, and, it, and everyone's very touchy about it because there's psychological background behind it too. Like you said, you know, what you learned as a childhood. So um, I like that idea of like having that questionnaire and normalizing it so everybody can see, okay, this is just a totally normal conversation to have. Yeah, yeah. Not, a, not a romantic conversation no. to have, but it's- This necessary. is a normal conversation to have. This is something we have to do. And I mean, you know, even when you go into business and it's funny what you were saying earlier, and I don't want to generalize because there are some super powerhouse women out there who are completely, this is what they do all the time, i.e. with contracts and so forth. But even when you go into business as women, we have very different conversations. Heather and I have a very different conversation around business than a man, two men would. You know, we're going to tiptoe around the financial stuff until a little bit later. We get to know each other. We chit chat. We do this. Whereas a man goes for the jugular and is like, all right, so what are we doing? What are we talking here? You know, 50, 50, 60, 20, da, 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 like, you know, like 60, 40, you know, it's like all that kind of stuff. Whereas a woman is kind of like, let's get to know each other and let's do this. And it's a different approach. So we already have a female male approach to certain things. So again, going back to this questionnaire, this helping them understand, okay, how do you have that conversation? So it's kind of more on an even skeven thing, you know, like you don't feel, you know, what you said just really hit something for me because it is, there is a, a gender gap on how we talk about money and how we negotiate for ourselves. It's, it's just a reality. We don't teach our daughters how to negotiate salaries. We don't teach our daughters how to go after jobs and ask for promotions the same way that a lot of fathers teach their sons, but we're mm -hmm. not doing that. And a lot of our conversations about money are tied into our feelings about our own self-worth yes. and not wanting to hurt somebody else's feelings. And right. if we're negotiating from that standpoint, you're just always going to be something that you don't say, and you're going to regret not saying it. And then the resentment builds. And that's, it's, it can be avoided. And when you're in a room talking with somebody who can help you through that, like people fight about money, fight about money in their bedrooms, in their kitchen, in front of their children and with their therapists. Mm -hmm. Well, how about just having the conversation beforehand? You wouldn't believe something like we all, we've all talked with people going through divorces. So we know this comes up, but talk about like, look at our friends and how they manage money in their relationships. For example, there are people who are very, very comfortable with debt. They believe in leveraging a lot of stuff and they'll carry debt. They'll bounce it around on a 0% interest every year, change a new credit card. Like this is just what they do because it's how they manage money and they're not scared and they're leveraged. Other people, the idea of carrying a credit card balance of $1 the next month, they feel like utter failures in life and it's just a crisis, right? So talk about why that's so scary to somebody, why it's not scary. Those are the core. Like the, I, I like to think of this as getting to know your partner better, right? Why don't we mm -hmm. talk about those things? What scares you about money? What scares you about being in debt? What scares you about, like, what makes you feel like a loser? If you're not in debt, you want to leverage this. Those conversations should be as normal and as comfortable as, so why do you still like the chargers when they keep losing, Julie? 
I mean, you yeah. know, I, it's easy. And going back to the idea of sitting down and doing estate planning together, right? Like if, if you're going to sit down with your spouse, you're going to be having a conversation about how much money do we need to retire? What do we want to do when we retire? What, you know, and, and that is all normal. Well, those are the exact kinds of spending type hab habitual conversation or spending conversations you need to have. Yes. Like what is, you know, okay, we need to put this much away in our savings then each month so that when we get to that point or, you know, but that could be part of your, your, your marriage contract conversation as well. And sometimes people don't need a prenup, but the fact that they're having conversations about money is wonderful. So I had a couple come in about six years ago and one of them, what I think was 82 and the other one, she was in her late seventies and their kids were like, you have to go get a prenup. You two are not getting married without a prenup. It's too scary because they're not because they didn't want their, their two sets of parents to be like in love and get married. They were thrilled for them, but they were worried that in that idea of love and so on in the later parts of their life, that they were missing some important financial considerations. So when I sat down with them, we spent about an hour and a half just talking through their assets, what their hopes were. I said, you guys don't need a prenup. Everything you already have is separate property. You have a plan for how you're going to handle your finances. You don't need a prenup. You have this agreement and you have your estate plan and that's all you need. Because chances are when you're getting married at 82, it's probably not going to end in divorce. It's probably more likelihood that it's going to end in death than divorce. So I was comfortable at the level of relationship that they had in the later years of their life that they could make that decision and not need a prenup. But that conversation mm -hmm. and the fact that they could talk to their families about it, come and talk to me about it with each other made me even more happy that they didn't need a prenup because they're, they're talking like that they were comfortable talking about money. And right. that made a huge difference. It, it was really a great experience. I feel um, like it, at that age, it's less scary. I think more at someone like I'm in my forties, mm -hmm. having it now, I'm, I'm a little bit less scared about it, but also I'm more protective. Like I feel like in my twenties, when I got married, we, I wasn't, we didn't really talk about a lot. We both kind of came in, we were both, you know, making good money, starting our careers or mid, you know, like early enough in our careers that anything we did, we were building together. Um, and I actually owned a house. I had stuff I was bringing into the marriage and um, we just both were like, whatever. Like, I'm like, oh, you can have everything. And the, now though, I'm like, oh, I think I need to have a conversation. Like I, I do believe going into a relationship, even a cohabitation situation and, and as much to protect him as to protect me. And I think, you know, there is something that, you know, we, that we talk about, like, I wouldn't, if he's going to move into my house, let's pretend I would want him to be protected because I'm like, nah, that's my house. Like, even though if you're helping with bills, I, I still want you to not lose out on an opportunity to build equity or savings or in something. Right. So, I love what you said about protecting yourself and protecting him. Yeah. But I like to add one more layer of protection and that's protecting your relationship. Mm, yeah because talking about money and contracting to have that really can protect your relationship because yeah, there's you any unknowns then like we're both like yes i agree everything is on the table then no i yes that that's a great way of saying it and, and anytime way. you're doing something that is with the purpose of avoiding future conflict then you're doing something to protect the integrity of the relationship of the person you want to be with so it's the relationship and you can protect that. And you know what, when you're 25 years old and you don't have anything, maybe you don't need a prenup, right? You do, but you do need to be educated about what you're, what, what you're taking on when you get married and what those obligations and so on can, can become. You mentioned mm -hmm. having a house before you're married. Well, mm -hmm. so many people, they do, they have a house in their twenties, right? And what they don't know is that later on, 30 years later, when you're gonna get divorced, if that happens, all of a sudden this thing called Family Code 2640 comes up. <laughs> Did you have any separate property before the marriage that transferred in? Like, what if you sold that home and rolled it into the community property? Well, who the hell keeps records from 20 years ago? Like, we don't have those things. If you do not. a if you do <laughs> a, a prenup and you have to go in and document what you have at the time that you're getting married, then you've got those records. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's actually is very important to note. I mean, that's and when it came to the timing of my own divorce, both of us were like, we can't trace anything like we could never even and we couldn't be bothered. We were like, oh, it's fine. Like, but I, I see so often people do care, right? Like I was lucky neither of us cared. But when you do care, it is important and it's critical. And I, I think that inventorying of things at your date of marriage, I mean, being someone who's on the financial side of a lot of divorces, um, you know, I look at that and I'm like, oh God, what I would, it's gold. I mean, that is gold dust. Like if you can baseline where you're at when you get married, it is an amazing, you know, tool to use later on and, and in, uh, under unfortunate circumstances, but you're very excited if you have that tool. Can I tell you another example of something that I use quite a bit when I'm talking to clients who are getting married or, or who are um, mediating a divorce. Our laws are not always fair. And so when you do get your prenup called the California Family Code, you may not like the way it turns out in a divorce. And I'm gonna give an example that I think everybody should listen to. If I'm married, let's say I'm married 20 years. And during the marriage, I get an inheritance of $200,000 and my spouse gets an inheritance of $200,000. Okay, they're both separate property. Like I get to get my separate property, but I take my 200,000 and I put it down on a home that we want for our family, right? And he takes his 200,000 and says, great, we've got this house. Now I'm gonna put this in a college fund and we're gonna pay for the kids to go to college. Now, fast forward, your kids are out of college, you're still in the house and you get divorced. You know, family code 2640, I get my $200,000 back because it was put into the house. It's a down payment, it's using separate property to acquire community property. I get my $200,000 back. Guess mm -hmm. what happens to his $200,000 that got spent on our children? It's gone. it's gone. And that is patently unfair. And people don't know that they're making those choices during their marriage. They don't even know that that's happening until they are at each other's throats in a divorce. And that person's like, well, I hated my husband anyways. And I want that $200,000. And I don't care if it's not fair. Right. Too bad. So sad. You shouldn't have had sex with a secretary. I mean, I don't know. Like, it's yeah. just, you, you got to do it before those problems arise because you could have easily drafted a post-marital agreement that said each of us are receiving an inheritance and I am putting it into the house and I'm waiving a 2640 claim. And you are putting this into college to be used for the children and you waive reimbursement rights or you fund it equally so that you each have a hundred thousand in the house and a hundred thousand in there. But nobody's parents die at the same time and give you the money on the same day. Like that really happens. Right. But that is something to me that is such a stark example of how unfair our laws can be, but they're the laws you signed up for. Right. Yeah. The, the that you should have with. been educated <laughs> on when you got your marriage license. Like there should be a test to get a marriage license. <laughs> right. <laughs> at least some, I mean, it's an hour yeah. class online that you have to pass a little test on. I don't know. I mean, they make it harder for you to, to do anything besides that. It's harder for me to get a credit card for $500 than it is for me to get married. I think separate property, community property at a minimum should be the, you know, the pass fail criteria of understanding that. Cause that's where I see a huge amount of the conflict that comes in. And, you know, when you're, especially when you're tracking your assets through the life of your marriage and to your point, inheritance and, you know, how you fund things and how you track it is, would be amazing for people to understand going into a marriage. Yeah. Um, so, but going back, okay. So going into the discussion of the post nup idea. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and I, I've had several friends that have done post nups for a variety of reasons. One was a similar story to, to what you, um, shared. They actually were able to mitigate that. Um, another one was when a marriage hit the rocks and there was so much fear over what the financial reality would look like, um, if they got divorced that she just wanted to know what a settlement would, would look like. And then so that she was financially secure so that then she could just really work on the relationship. So they went and got a, a post nup um, and dictated what the terms of their divorce would be in order to create a safe space for them to then work on their marriage and not have it be about the money. Um, so what are some other examples of like post nup type situations that that people engage with or engage in? Um, 
Well, a lot of them will get money and they want to be able to keep certain separate, uh, and, but make investments and they want to document it. And so we do post nups for that. There are the way to spend money sometimes, or sometimes maybe there's been bad investments and a lot of guilt around it. Somebody may promise then that another asset goes to the spouse. Like, for example, I see a lot of people who have spent money on business investments and some do really, really well. And guess where the majority fall, right? Like people have put money in and money in and money in and they're losing it. And then the other party is scared. So you can actually post up that takes away some of that fear. You say, okay, we have $200,000 of equity in the house and we have $200,000 of money in our savings account. You can take $100,000 of that and go start a business and I get $100,000 of secure equity in my house so that I'm never going to lose that. I mean, you right. can do things like that. I, I know it sounds funny, but, or I want to buy a vet. Well, <laughs> okay, go buy a Corvette, but that's $40,000. I want to secure $40,000 for me to do something else Mm. that I don't lose if we get divorced. And sometimes it's not even about getting divorced. It's how you're spending money and how you're dealing with money in a relationship. And you may not want to get divorced. I had a a couple who, he was very depressed and he was getting older and he was gambling a lot. And that was what he wanted to do. And she was terrified that he was going to go through their assets and her friends were telling her to get a divorce. So we don't have, you don't have to get a divorce. We can structure something where all these assets are in your name and you can't sell them without your consent and permission. And then we set up an account where if he's going to gamble, he's going to gamble from it. He's going to gamble. If you don't want to live with a gambler, then you have to get divorced. If you're willing to live with a gambler, as long as your money is protected, then protect your money. And Hope he does well. Go cheer him on at poker. <laughs> but you're not scared about losing your share of something. Right. Um, retirement asset. That sometimes people want to lock that in for something specific and other people want to spend it. So it can be a way that you manage conflict in your marriage by having agreements for your money. Because are we fight about money and kids more than anything else in relationships. I'm sure that you two have seen that hundreds and hundreds of times. Well, you can't contract for better kids. Well, we hear our well, we hear our parents do it. I mean, it's a triple down effect. You know, you hear your parents oh, yeah. for money, then the, their parents fighting over money. It's been from the test of time. You know, so yeah, we take it with us, and and we can contract for those differences in money. Mm-hmm. You can't contract for kids like you can't contract for a more well-behaved kid, or that you're going to love one kid more than the other, or if we get divorced and get our daughter because she drives me crazy. I mean, you can't contract your kid stuff or, you know, there's 15 minutes of this of screen time and then not, but you can contract around money. And since that's 50% of why we are in divorces, a lot patient about money and also feeling like our, our, our needs and our desires are not heard by our spouse when we talk about money because they don't even recognize the conversation is different because they don't know the effect that they're having on our psyches when they're talking about money from a way because they just people assume that everybody's got the same viewpoint about money and exactly. you don't want to keep credit card debt and leverage it why would you want to pay all that back that's stupid like then they look at you like you're stupid and you're like I just I see it differently and if you know those types of things you can contract around and listen to each other and having that conversation is going to make a stronger relationship or end one that really should never start. Right. It's going to protect your relationship, as you said, which is great. Well, we are at, we just have a few minutes left. Um, so I don't see any questions from the audience no. yet. So um, what else? I'm going to put in our uh, chat how to get a hold of you. Um, and for finding someone to support you through this, like I know someone like yourself is great. Like, would it be go look for a mediator? Not a mediator, um, though, right? It's um, specific, somebody who has some well versed. Well, you'd want to make sure. I mean, a lot of mediators are trained to help people through a divorce. You know, even therapists really, you want to be able to have the conversations about money. That's what's most important. And if 
I wish there were more people offering this to, to clients and saying, please come and talk to me about a premarital agreement in a different way. Let's, I, I wish I could come up with a different word for a premarital agreement. Like maybe I think it, a living document. I like this idea of a living document. Yeah. It's kind of like a li living together document. It's, it, it really is that because in the end of the day, it's like you're going in and you're living together. I mean, the whole idea, I think that sounds better and it has less of a connotation of negative connotation because prenuptials, it's like, oh, you know, but what about, you're not just prenuptial, you're going to live with it. <laughs> so. It's a marriage contract. I mean, it, it is actually, or, you know. But then it does evolve and it does change. So that's why this idea of a living document sounds yes. a little bit I like, like yeah. Or, mm -hmm. I like that idea. So. And I like the idea of building your own marriage contract. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. we write our vows. People spend more time writing their vows for the two minutes they're going to be talking in front of people at their wedding to make those promises than they do about how they're going to set up their finances. So it, it's funny. I um, was married with a Jewish ceremony. And so there's an actual contract called a ketubah. And mm -hmm. we, um, my ex-husband's mom actually wrote it up and she very specifically made the language about us and used quotes that were important to us, um, mm -hmm. things, you know, and so this is similar to that, like you're creating your own contract and then, you know, we signed it, the rabbi signed it. We had a co-officiated wedding. So the, um, the other co-officiant also signed it. So uh, it was, it, but it's a great way to do something like that. Like it was, it's your version of your marriage contract. And it was different than you like know what it. we were signing from a legal standpoint. It was our more of the life side of the contract, but um, but I like that, and that I would like people to remember what marriages always have been. Marriages have been a contract. They're a contract that people entered into to protect property, to protect their children's names and inheritance rights. That's all marriage was. It was a way to set up society to pass property ship ownership and have rights and obligations to each other. It had nothing to do with romantic love. It had nothing to do with sex. It had nothing to do with any of that stuff. It had to do with property preservation and knowing how things are held and that you can pass it on. Even as simple as you marry my daughter, I give you three cows. I mean, yeah. that's, yeah. It, this goes back to such a, a, I can't even imagine a time in history until the last hundred years that this was not common. All of a sudden it's right. about bells and whistles and fancy dresses and love and romance. Well, that wears off in the contract sense of a marriage and what we're getting into with creating a life with another person. Let's talk about that. Let's make, in, make money a normal part of that conversation. It's not that it's not romantic. I think it's very romantic to trust your partner so much that you want to create a life plan with them for what your marriage is going to look like. It really does create that trust, honestly. It sets the bar. It sets the tone for the, your marriage. Um, and then when you are doing the bickering, it's not about those intrinsically heavy things and conversations. You know, there's not an underlining issue. It's more like, stop putting your socks all over the ground <laughs> or, or, you know, pick up your clothes or whatever. You know, those are the little things that you're bickering out, you know, not those big macro level things. So, um, this is great. I mean, I love this. I love how you're so behind this, Julie, because I, we always mm -hmm. talk about it, especially when you go through a divorce, you always say, and, and as having children, we know we want to change that narrative. We really want them to understand that this is okay. Let's normalize this. Let's make this so that, you know, we're not trying to get you out of a job, but, and, or <laughs> us out of a job, but, but, you know, hopefully, I mean, that's the, you know, that would be the best thing that at least if, marriage doesn't last, it's not going to be so acrimonious. It's not going to be, you know, the war of two worlds. And, you know, it's just, it's, it is what it is. I love the idea too, of using these tools um, to, I mean, as a continuous option that, I mean, I hadn't really thought about a lot of those post nup ideas. And when people are having conflict, using it to mitigate that conflict. And to mm -hmm. just like your gambling person example, like, great, you still love that person. You want to live with a gambler? No big deal. Like you, but you, you don't like the way that he spends money or where he's allocating it to. Let's protect ourselves against yeah. your bad behavior. Or I mean, not even bad behavior because they wouldn't, 
It's just whatever behavior choices you're making and then move on. Like, I love that. I think it's, it, that can take the stigma away a lot too. I love it. Thank you so much for giving me this forum because like I said, this is what I am passionate about, helping people have better relationships or into their relationships in a better way, whatever it is. I just wanna help them transition into or out of those in a more amicable, more life-affirming way. Yep. Yes. Nope, us too. You're here. Us too. Thank you. Thank you <laughs> again Thank you. for joining us. Thank you, you guys. Keep up the good work. A lot of people need you. Yep, you, you too. Thank you. <laughs> yeah.